So history is uh, uh, exciting. And these days and ages, we are um, learning also that we want to include more history and more voices um, to make history more truthful. And as the Bainbridge Island Historical Community Outreach Manager, um, I'm honored to bring stories of individuals that live on Bainbridge Island. And today I am thrilled because I get to be here and you, you all get to be here with uh, TJ Faddis, who barely needs an introduction, but um, welcome TJ. Uh, TJ, will you please do the honor of introducing yourself briefly? Hi guys. Hey, thanks for having me, Katie and Reed. Um, I'm TJ Faddis, and I think my big claim to fame on a small island is I ran the uh, Linwood Theater from off and on from 1984 to uh, about almost 2012. Um, so I ran it when we were the only show in town, literally, only film show in town. Um, and then with the Bainbridge Cinemas popping up in 1998, we turned the Linwood Theater into uh, an independent film house showing independent film documentaries, foreign films, classics, silent film with live music accompaniment. And so we expanded the program significantly over that last 12 years. Oh, I love that theater. I'm sure everybody here can say the same. Oh, thank you. Yeah. It. <laughs> yep, so yep. let's see. Let me start off, though, with um, what what's your Bainbridge Island story? What brought you to Bainbridge Island and who did you come with? Oh, that was a, a, a interesting story. We had a, a, a friend. Well, we all lived back in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And so at this in the within this group. Co uh, cohesive group, uh, Jeff Riley one day said, well, I just read where uh, Seattle, Washington is the world's most livable city and I'm moving to, to Seattle. And, uh, and everyone went, what? Uh, so people started moving to Seattle and you know who's the last one to get here? Not until 1992, Jeff Riley, who started the exodus in the first place. But um, we, we, we ended up here on uh, Columbus Day, 1978. And it was uh, a wonderful experience to come from. Pittsburgh is a nice place to live, but, um, you know, both my husband and I are small town, small Pennsylvania town kids. And, uh, and so to, to come out here and meet uh, a more diverse group of people, um, free thinking um, uh, was, was a gift, yeah. Oh, and didn't we luck out? I love that. And I love that the guy who had the first idea came here, <laughs> followed. Last, dead last. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, um, and then, uh, what was the community like? What did you find when you were here? Who did you come with? Was it just you and? It, uh, it was uh, myself and my now husband, um, Charlie. And uh, we drove cross country. Uh, and I'll tell you what it was like. It had 15,000 people at the time. Um, and Nothing was open past eight o'clock. You had three grocery stores from which to shop, but they weren't open after eight and there were no Jiffy Marts. So if you needed a gallon of milk, you had to drive to Paul's Bow. Um, no pizza places. Um, and, uh, and if you, uh, when it snowed and if you couldn't get up the hill, well, you just left your car and you walked home. Um, and, you know, and you could do that back in those days. Uh, fortunately, we were from Pennsylvania. So when we snowed, when, when it snowed, um, in fact, 
when we got here in 78, the first week of first or second week in November, um, a big snowstorm hit. And, uh, and I read in the paper that Back to the Future was showing at the Almo Theater in Paulsbo. And I said to Chuck, we should go. And, and he goes, yeah. So we got in the car and there was a lot of snow. It really was snow. And then we dodged the cars that were, you know, stuck on hills and drove to Paulsbo. And we found the Almo Theater. And uh, when we went inside, we were surprised people were leaning up against the uh, concession stand looking at the door and when we walked in they said seven eight right and we look around and they said they're not going to show the film until there are 10 of us here and I went oh okay so we turned around and leaned against the concessions counter like everybody else and after a couple of minutes the door opened and we went nine 10 woohoo and we found our seats and we got to see back to the future in the middle of this snowstorm and it was fun that's a classic classic wonderful story <laughs> <laughs> thank you thank you so um let's see then um how did you find community were there organizations were there were you in Engaged with the schools at all? Did did children come along? What's the story? Well, we we eventually did have kids for sure, and um, we we uh, developed a lovely community with Island School over there on Day Road, um, and well, you know, I'll go back further to 1978-79. Some of you old timers will remember Joan the Phone down on Madison Avenue. And she had a typing service, but no typist. Uh, so that was the first thing I did when I came to the island was I, I, I did the typing service. I was the typing service and that's where I met Sam. And, um, and he was looking for a secretary. So uh, he hired me away. And that was fortuitous because he would eventually purchase Linwood Center and the Linwood Theater. And when one day he said to me, I don't need a secretary anymore, I need a theater manager. And I went, okay, let's figure this one out. So that's how I became a theater manager, the Linwood Theater. He had no one else to do it. <laughs> Well, that's great, but like, I know that, you know, you wanted to see Back to the Future in the Snow, so maybe you liked film, but were you even into film at that time? I was, I was indeed, um, and, you know, the only way to scratch that itch, if you didn't go to the theater or have a theater nearby, would be to watch uh, dialing for dollars where they would show a movie. Do you remember dialing for dollars on TV and, um, uh, and, and watch movies on TV with commercial interruptions? And that's no way to watch a movie. So, yeah, the, you can't beat the theater experience. But you hadn't been to the Linwood Theater before you worked there? Oh, actually, Katie, I did. Um, and this was back in the time when um, Lucille Nolta and her husband Glenn owned the theater and they ran it. And Glenn did the box office, Lucille did the concessions, um, and Glenn would patrol the aisles, especially on a Friday night with his trusty flashlight. And, um, uh, and they were open five days a week, Thursdays through Tuesday. No, Fridays through Tuesday. And two wonderful ladies, Joyce DePew and Phyllis Lungard, uh, talked with uh, Glenn Nolta and asked if they could have the Linwood on Wednesdays and Thursdays when Glenn was dark. And these two ladies brought to the island foreign films. So yeah, uh, Wednesdays and Thursdays were foreign film night. And I had never seen a foreign film before. And my very first film was La Casha Fall, um, which was the source material for The Birdcage with Robin Williams. 
Uh, my second film was Lena Wertmuller's Swept Away with Giancarlo Giannini. Whew, hot stuff. And, um, and then my third film was Fellini's Satyricon. And I <laughs> couldn't tell you what it was about, but I, there are some visuals there that, yes, that stick with you. And, uh, and I was hooked. I just really found something that ignited my imagination. Um, I'm thinking about the 70s here on the island and I'm thinking, you know, a little bit like rural and earthy in a way and that kind of stuff. And so um, was the international film thing popular? It was. It was on Bainbridge, yes. Um, and what was fun, because, you know, I remembered those experiences going to the Linwood for the foreign films. And so in the early 90s, um, when I was working with Sam at the Linwood, I asked him if I could have the month of October, because October, you know, September, October, those are dead months um, at a movie theater. Um, and, um, and he gave me the month of October to run a foreign film festival. And I really liked the people who came through the door during the month of October. Like-minded, searching people, um, you know, searching for truth, answers, community. Um, and, uh, and so when we had the opportunity to turn the Linwood into an art house place, I knew we already had a built-in audience. So that was pretty special. It sounds wonderful. It sounds wonderful. So um, do you have anything that was um, special? Why don't you repeat, like, how long were you there? And I'm wondering, are there any standout experiences that you want to share? Well, let's see. I was out there. Um, 1984 is when I started. Uh, oh, I'll give you a really good story. And it's true. The, uh, during uh, Fahrenheit 9-11, we had sold out crowds um, for every show for three weeks solid. And, um, and so many times just getting people in and seated was was stressful. Um, and one particular show, uh, a very sweet friend of mine, Greg, came in um, and he was kind of late. I'd already gone down front and done the pre-show talk. And I was only coming to start the film. And he, he said, TJ, can I get in? I said, Greg, I only have one seat left, just one. And he goes, I'll take it. So I send him into his seat. I run upstairs to start the movie. And at the time, the, the most sophisticated anim, um, not animation, automation that we had in the projector booth was an aluminum box that was full of about 98 to 120 plastic gears. And you would push this button and all of those gears would turn until they lined up just perfectly. And then when you hit the go button, it would bring down the lights, raise the curtain and start the projector, get you on, on the show. But, uh, but you had to hit that preset button first to get everything lined up. Well, the go button and the preset button looked the, exactly the same and they are at the same place on the panel. And so I accidentally hit the preset button instead of the go button. And it takes 90 seconds for those little plastic gears to all turn and get ready to go. And Greg sat down and he started talking to these two ladies next to him and he fell in love with one of them. He wanted to know this woman more. 
and he had all of 90 seconds to get as much information as he could about her, but he never got her name. And so, and he had to leave before the movie ended. So he ended up having to put, he put a classified ad in the newspaper looking for this lady, not knowing her name. And Woodley's friends read this ad and said, Woodley, this guy's looking for you. And he met you at the Linwood. And anyway, to this day, they are happily married. All because I hit the wrong button. <laughs> oh, that's such a fun story. Oh, man. Thank you very much for that story. Um, let's see. So, yeah, as you were, um, I'm, I'm curious about the idea of doing the um, pre-talks that you did, because that to me was really unique. Uh, and I just, I just love them. Like I kind of felt that, oh, well, that's quintessential experience when you go to a movie on Bainbridge. So was that something that independent film places did all over and that's how you got started doing that? Or is that something that you just thought people should know about these films before we watch them? Well, what, what I wanted to do with them, uh, with, with, with the intro was to, um, well, you know, at a movie theater and at live shows, um, the show begins at the curb, right? And so, so people are already kind of excited to see the film unless you were dragged there uh, under duress. Um, and I wanted, I wanted to just add a, one more tidbit to add to the excitement of of the movie. Um, and that's why I started to do it. And then I, I was talking with Rocky Friedman, who uh, is still runs the uh, Rose Theater in Port Townsend. And he, he would do them too. Um, and in fact, Rocky was a wonderful resource to bounce ideas off of. Um, and uh, the whole, when I would run the Linwood, um, and we would go to previews uh, together and preview film to see if it would be um, a good good fit with our theater. So it um, sometimes what I would like to do sometimes if a, uh, a film critic had something especially pithy to say, I would share that with them. Um, but I'd always try to give them something to keep them excited. Uh, about the film while they sat through the previews. You did a fantastic job. <laughs> Thank you, Katie. <laughs> <laughs> so there you were, and you were, um, I don't know, I mean, I think a lot of people with a lot of passion work more than just those 39 or 40 hours a week, but when it's at night and everything, um, it must have been a lot, a lot of work, but you worked there for how many years? And then how did the de decision to, de to retire come up? Oh, well, it was easy when I first started because in 1984, there was one show a night at 7.30. And there wasn't a whole lot to do during the day because Sam curated the films at the Linwood at the time. Um, and weekends on uh, Saturday and Sunday, there'd be a matinee and, and that evening show and that was it. But once we went into the more, uh, the art house, um, I went full bore and, and put more films on the docket, um, more show times. Um, and I would, literally watch 80% of the films that I would show. I seldom put a show on that I hadn't already seen, um, which meant going to the city, going to the preview room, you know, watching the film on the big screen. Um, and then in time, sometimes we would get DVD screeners and um, it really came home to me on the film, the three burials of, um, Melchias Estrada, which is Tommy Lee Jones' uh, film. Um, and I had the screener 
and I'm watching it on the TV and it's like, okay, well, that's a good film. It's not a great film, but it's a good film. And when the agent said, so what do you think? Are you going to show it? And I went, yeah, it's all right. He goes, no, it's, it's big, TJ. I'm telling you, it's going to be big. And it wasn't until I saw that the scenery was the third character in the film. And when you see it on the big screen and you are in the deserts of Mexico, Arizona, New Mexico, um, it was a big film. So, yeah. But then, so when, between going to the city and viewing the films and um, maintaining the physical plant uh, of the theater, oh, and this was back in the time when you would build films with your bare hands. And, you know, the film, the film is probably about that big, right? Kind of little. And um, with, a, with a hose down the side. And you, you literally had to tape um the the film together and put it on one big platter so uh, a two-hour film would take eight reels and the packing reels were about 20 minute reels right and uh so you would build it and then at the end of the run you would pull it off of this this big reel and put it back onto the shipping reels and send it out and i remember some nights tearing down a film and feeling as if I were saying goodbye to my mom at the airport, you know, that it was, it was just one of those films, there were several of them, but they would touch the audience, something like winged migration and, and, um, oh, the wild parrots of Telegraph Hill, you know, and there'd be a, that film where you, I would just have to say goodbye to it. Yeah. And that was pretty special. But over time, what with the added show times and running off to Seattle to see film and, you know, um, and after, after about 12 years of that, um, it began to take a toll on my health. So I kind of had to walk away and de-stress. And uh, thank goodness for meds and yoga and... <laughs> And now I go to the movies for fun. <laughs> that's it. That's wonderful. Uh, there's a, a lot of stories these days about self-care and how all of us must learn how to do that. So especially, it, yeah, took, yeah. That, took that time. So, and uh, I don't want to miss out on the fact that you also, like you mentioned, had kids going through Bainbridge schools and things. And I was just wondering how did living on Bainbridge, do you think, influence your children growing up? Oh, oh, wow. Well, living on Bainbridge was probably the safest place I knew on the planet to raise kids. It, you know, the um, shopkeepers knew your kids um, and uh, uh, other drivers knew when your kids were driving um you know and, and we just kind of keep an eye out for each other's kids here on on the island but my kids became concessionaires when they were 15 and um and i think that that helped them develop their own um self-confidence uh, in meeting strangers um and uh you know my oldest is um a salesman and uh and he, he truly could uh, sell ice cubes in the tundra. He's a heck of a salesman. Uh, my daughter is a musician and uh, she doesn't hesitate to get up and, uh, and blow her saxophone in front of hundreds of people and gave them the self sense of confidence. And my concessionaires, I had some great, great, great kids. Um, and it was so much fun to, to have these young people come and, and ask for a job. Um, and, and they'd be so tentative when they started out. And, and, and I would try to instill skills in them, um, uh, people skills, you know, 
you know, how, what's a good way to handle this situation in the future. And, and, uh, and of course they would come up with their own ideas and, and we, it was a nice collaborative uh, process, but it was to see these, these young people as sophomores, you know, coming to the job uh, and then watching them leave um, at, when they graduate as seniors. And there are these confident people who, who can talk to anybody and, uh, about, not just about movies. And, uh, and we had some lovely conversations. I think, you know, those guys kept me young. Yeah, I was very lucky. It's so beautiful to see how people in the community will mentor, you know, young, young folks. And I know that one of the, uh, you know, one of the challenges of being on um, Bainbridge or any small community is just that um, you do get super comfortable. So how do you greet a stranger? How do you meet a stranger? And then movies also can be such a wonderful education of you know, places other than Bainbridge. So it's really, um, uh, I can imagine it being a favorite job for a lot of those students. And so did any of those students ever end up going into film? Let's see. Well, I think one is an attorney. Oh yes, some have, yes. And um, true, they have. Well, and then it was also a great place to meet local filmmakers between uh, Celluloid Bainbridge and Kathleen Thorne. Oh, she's amazing. Um, and those filmmakers who, who came to me with their film, I'm thinking of uh, Rick Stevenson, um, who had uh, expiration date that featured uh, the Smith Brothers Dairy, um, right? The people who deliver milk to your door. Yeah, and he came with this charming little film of, um, of a fella whose um, father and grandfather were hit by a Smith Brothers dairy truck on their 25th birthday. And he's getting ready, he's, he's lining everything up and getting rid of stuff because he's about to turn 25 and he knows it's gonna happen to him. And we had not just Rick Stevenson, the director, but um, our local Smith Brothers Dairy Farms, um, uh, people came and they gave out chocolate milk at the end of the show. And then they sang Barbershop Quartet there in the lobby. Um, Really some great times. Other filmmakers that we've had there, um, uh, local, uh, he's from Bainbridge, John Jeffcoat, he did Outsourced about, and this also stars Matt Smith as, as this, uh, God, he's a arrogant, awful boss. But, you know, Matt always brings something to the table where even though he's a terrible person, you'd still have a beer with him. Anyway, so, um, and that was the story about the, uh, the Seattle employee who, uh, they're outsourcing the whole, the whole shop, the whole office to India, and they're sending this man over to train his replacement to India. So he's a fish out of water in a country. Anyway, it's called Outsource. It has a lot of heart. So, and that was a good time. Mm -hmm. And I do have one more that ties into something current. Shall I say it, Katie? Okay. Taylor Gooderson. His father, you might have heard of him. <laughs> Dave Gooderson. No, maybe. <laughs> um, Dave Gooderson, who wrote uh, Snow Falling on Cedars. But Taylor is, he's a filmmaker who did the very delightful film Old Goats back several years ago. I mean, talk about a quintessential Baby Island film, right? Um, anyway, uh, Taylor's going to be here on Thursday night um, at the Linwood Theater. Thursday night, this coming Thursday, is a fundraiser for Linwood Theater and uh, Jeff Bryan's company, Far Away Entertainment. And they're going to show a film at 7.15 called Finding Bigfoot. And it's about this guy who is searching for the Sasquatch and what he finds along the way. 
So I'm really looking forward to it. Haven't seen it. But I'm looking forward to seeing Taylor Gooderson again um, and, uh, and seeing the film. And I, there are still tickets available. There are some tickets available. So if you want to come, come join us. I think it's going to be a great time. And another local filmmaker was, um, oh my God, I just, he did The Trouble with Harry. And his name just escaped me. Wait a second. Sheila, you remember. Tell me. No. Oh. Anyway. I'll look it up. I can't, I can't, I can't remember his name though. Oh, yeah, I remember the, the movie. Yes. Okay, good. Thanks, Sheila. Yeah, I can't believe I, the name just blew out of my mind. And um, my daughter was in the film. Um, and the, tr uh, the, uh, the trouble with Harry. And she was eight years old at the time. And she was called back to do several things, play d different characters. And, uh, and so, oh, I can't remember his name. Okay, now it's making me crazy. Faster, Sheila, faster. And, um, uh, and the director called to tell me that he was debuting his film at the Seattle Film Festival. Uh, and um, so I would go to the Seattle Film Festival religiously anyway. So I got us all tickets for, for Mandy, my husband and I, and Mandy's best friend and mortal enemy, Tina Saludos. And that's how Mandy would, that's how they would introduce each other. This is my best friend and mortal enemy. So, so we all went to the Egyptian theater to see Mandy in this film. And we're sitting there and we're about an hour and 40 minutes into it. And I'm thinking, you know, this is ending soon and Mandy hasn't shown up yet. Well, Garrick Bennett, ta-da! Sheila, I did it. So Garrett, Garrett Bennett was on stage before his film at SIF and he and introduced his film and he said I will be back to take questions at the end of the movie and so we're in the movie it's geez Louise it's going to be ending soon there's no Mandy she's sitting beside me getting kind of fidgety and suddenly at the very end of the movie there is Mandy on top of a building, one of those historic buildings in Port Townsend in slow motion throwing hats off the roof of the building, right? And that was kind of her. That, that, that was her big moment. And so when Garrett, when the credits roll and he bounds up on stage and says, okay, anyone have any questions? Little eight-year-old Mandy stands up and says, yeah, where the hell's my part? <laughs> it's farewell to Harry. Farewell to Harry. Yeah, Thank you, Harry love. Talk, That's yeah. right. It's okay. <laughs> yes. Anyway, Garrett, Garrett didn't hear it, but people three rows ahead of us were turning around and laughing. So, yeah. Anyway, it's called Farewell to Harry. Farewell Sorry. to Harry. Thank yeah. you for that. Thanks fabulous. for letting me tell that. Yeah. Fabulous. I, I just, fabulous story. Uh, there's another possible title, Hats Off to Harry. Oh. <laughs> Which is oh. what I found when I was doing the search to figure out who, uh, who deserved the credit. Garrett. And it looks like it's Garrett Bennett and Ann Wilkinson. Yes. Yes, indeed. Yes. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. Farewell to Harry or hats off to Harry. Hats, well, hats off means that your daughter actually had the starring role right there at the end. <laughs> I'll tell her that. <laughs> <laughs> so let's see. I do want to encourage anybody, if they have any questions, to put them in the chat. But I just wanted to then say, um, well, your um, contributions and uh, and um, spirit in all of the Bainbridge um, arts and culture certainly uh, did not go to sleep when you left there. What happened after there? Oh, Katie, thanks for asking. Yeah, the, um, the uh, Bainbridge Island Museum of Art 
um, contacted me. They were having some difficulties um, with their um, audiovisual equipment in the auditorium, and they wanted someone to run it. Um, and uh, and that was really nice that they asked me. That was Greg Robinson who asked me. And I gave it a lot of thought because I had spent so much time, effort, and um, to try to preserve old Bainbridge at Linwood Theater. Um, and, and it kind of does hold old Bainbridge within its walls. And, um, and then I thought, oh, wow, can I embrace future Bainbridge? Uh, you know, how, how do you go from holding on to what you know and needs preserved to embracing the future? And, and I thought about it and finally decided, just take the plunge. There's good people behind the, the idea of the Bainbridge Island Museum of Art. And I was on board before they had even broken ground. So I had no idea what this was going to look like or be or feel like. And it's like, oh, I like working with Greg. I know these are good people. What could possibly go wrong? And uh, it was, it's been a good fit. And I'm still there on a volunteer basis. And they asked me to run film series. And at the end of our discussion, I'll tell you about these cool series that are coming up. <laughs> well, as, uh, as someone who preserves old Bainbridge, right? Um, that's what our historical museum does. Um, how, I just am curious about that, that touchy place. Like, what was it, you said you were on board before they asked you that. What was that like? How, how did that connection to take this plunge happen? Do you remember? Oh, let's see. No, I, no, I don't remember, Katie. Um, except that, you know, change is inevitable. Um, it's going to happen. And sometimes if you can be a part of it, you can bring something of yourself to the table um, that it might not have otherwise. That's great. Well, I don't know if it's great, but well, it's, it's, it's it takes it takes. Um, I think probably it sounds like you said that Greg. Did you know Greg before all of this? Or no, no, not at all. Oh, and Joel, hi, Joel. I see you there, my friend. Nice to see you. Do you see what's behind me? Oh, that's the picture from the 70th uh, celebration at the Linwood. We're all standing there with glow right, sticks. Right. Cool. Well, I have this one right here in front of me, just by chance. Oh, is this the one with people in the glasses? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> oh. So, some of you might have been in there. I don't know. I was behind the curtain. Yeah. <laughs> well, fun days. Oh, no kidding. Joel, and you know, you were such an important part of documenting. Here we go. There's your picture, my friend. You were so important in documenting what was going on um, at the time. And I've always valued um, you being there like that. I was part of that community. It was a real pleasure. I miss it a lot, like we all do. Oh, yeah, 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 me too. Oh. Well, and the, the sad thing is, well, you know, okay, so I'm volunteering at uh, Baby Channel Museum of Art. Um, and, uh, you know, at one point I was talking to somebody about the Linwood and they were talking about, you know, oh man, you have the best job in town. And it's like, yeah, I know. And I said, you know, they wouldn't even have to pay me to do this job, but I do appreciate the paycheck. <laughs> I can say I can I can say that the few months that I spent with you, when I learned how to work that platter thing, 
upstairs, which drove me up the wall, by the way, most of the time, um, as you well know. But the few, the few months, and I don't even remember how long I worked uh, with you uh, at the Linwood, but um, to be able to deliver the speech at the beginning of the program, uh, it was such fun to see the people's eyes just sort of like, oh, good, you know, this kind of thing. And it was, that was fun. Um, and I, just to see the people, my friends coming into the theater. Um, I, the only bad part was having to work the film thing upstairs. <laughs> that was the only part that just drove me up the wall. But I, I did it. I did you did it. do it, Sheila. Yep. Yeah, no, that is, yeah, the fact that you did it means that you're part of an exclusive club, kiddo. Yeah. Yeah, I hope nobody has to go through that. <laughs> they, don't, they don't do those things anymore, do they? <laughs> no, you push a button nowadays and start the film. I wouldn't know what to do <laughs> if I didn't have to go and, and worry about whether he had to piece that together. And yeah, mm -hmm, yeah, absolutely. But I guess what I really want to say is thank you, TJ, for all that you did for me uh, and help and, and how you taught me. When I was there, you talked about talk, teaching this question, the concessionaires. You certainly taught me, and I enjoyed. I enjoyed going over there on Thursday nights. Let me tell you, it was. Oh, thank you, Sheila. We needed your help. Thank you for for providing it. Yeah, ah, uh, yeah. The projector beasts could be something. You know, they. Uh, it it runs film through there at uh, uh, forty eight frames a second, and that's two feet per second. Um, so we can chew film pretty quick. Uh, and uh, yeah, not that I chewed a lot of film, but yeah, things could go wrong. The projector beasts. Yeah, but nowadays it's all digitized. And so um, the only training you really need to run a film is, you know, computer savvy. And then how to get the permissions. Oh, yes, right. Yeah, trying to get theatrical rights. Holy cow. Yeah, that, yeah sometimes it took boxing gloves to get what I wanted, but, um, but well, yeah. Dan, did you have a question that you wanted to ask TJ? Well, I, I just had a, a couple experiences I wanted to share. I mean, this is such a delight to actually interact with you and hear your history. Uh, we moved here in 1990. And, you know, in some ways I feel like an old timer. But um, I, we moved here right before school started. And I uh, got a job teaching at Ordway. And a couple of uh, fellow teachers asked me if I wanted to go to the uh, celluloid festival oh, with yeah. them. And I, I mean, we hadn't even really seen a lot on the island. I said, oh, okay. And uh, that, that's when I really fell in love with the Linwood uh, Theater and you. And that was kind of the highlight of uh, my husband and I of our social life was going to the Linwood Center. And I have to share one experience that um, this has brought back to me. Uh, there was one time um, that you were having a lot of problems with the projector and you know it wasn't working and everything. And so you just got up in, uh, in front of the audience there and entertained us <laughs> while, while, while the film was being, whatever you were doing, splicing or, and I mean, I didn't grow up in a small town. I'm originally from uh, outside of New York City. And so, you know, this was just such a unique experience. And uh, because of that, uh, you know, just the Linwood Center was always our favorite. And <laughs> I have to admit when the Bainbridge uh, cinemas opened, we, we didn't really go there. <laughs> 
just like we wouldn't go to Safeway. We only went to GNC. <laughs> right. <laughs> to support, support small business. So thank you so much with the, uh, with the joy you've brought to everyone throughout the years. Thank you, Jan. It's a wonderful place. Wow. Thanks. Thank you so much. Aww. Jan, it's so important that you shared that. You know, um, it's that uh, what we're always wondering about is what, what are some of the quintessential Bainbridge stories that we can share with newcomers, you know, not to exclude them, but to include them and to understand, you know, what it makes it special, you know, to live here and how our history influences who we are today. So um, thank you for sharing that story. Does well, I, have I can share another one that was um, just uh, quintessential. Uh, 1990 was when um, we, well, the first huge storm that we experienced and we lived on Byron and um, the, uh, my husband was working at uh, Seafirst. And so he was over in the city and you know, the storm hit, they kept him there and I was at home. And then all these trees just came down over the driveway. And I said, you know, I don't care, I'm, I'm coming over to Seattle. So I walked to the ferry, went over to Seattle and then coming back, I had no, you know, I really had no way to get back to the house then, plus the fact all these trees were down. Well, uh, someone in a Jeep saw me at the ferry and said, do you need a ride in, uh, with the roads? And it looks like you don't have a car. I said, no, no, I don't. He said, well, I'd be happy to take you. And I said, well, uh, the gosh, <laughs> I was just blown away. And then I said, but you know, there's all these trees that are down over our driveway. And he said, well, that's even better because I heat my house by wood and I can really use the, the logs. If that, if you would allow me to do that with my chainsaw. And I said, sure. <laughs> so he, I hopped in the Jeep. He, he cut his, Cut us, cut our way in to to get me into the house, and then he continued and took all the all the wood. So anyway, another <laughs> vintage story about how what a wonderful place Bainbridge is. I love that, that community of caring for each other and offering help is wonderful. That's great, definitely. Well, um, thank you, everybody. TJ, do you have um any any kind of um, thing that you want to conclude with. Um, we do want to hear about what's coming up for you. And I do want to acknowledge, you know, that, and here we are all with, um, you know, the Historical Museum and the Senior Center organizations. So I love the way that all the organizations interconnect. And Joel, it's really great to see you. Joel has a, a wonderful exhibit at our history. Thanks for mentioning that. Yeah, good. Thank you. Um, and we're open on Friday, Saturday, Sundays, and um, the visitors have just been loving it, Joel. It's called Vanishing Bainbridge. <laughs> so, um, TJ, I want to ask if you have any other story that you'd like to um, put on record. Oh, I do. I wanted to just mention my husband, Chuck, who uh, is the man who designed and built the marquee at the Linwood Theater. Um, and, uh, uh, the old one was definitely rusting apart and he designed it. He taught himself how to TIG weld, um, and he built that marquee, uh, by, and kept the reader board operational every night. So, and, and, it, and so he, it was this big repair on this marquee um and it he he it took him about a thousand hours with some help from jonathan Mannheim and our very dear friend ron carlson ron would help me run the linwood off and on all of those years when i ran it 
Um, and uh, and Ron is still in the area. He lives in Bremerton now and works in Palsbo, but not in movies. Anyway, uh, oh, there's the marquee. Yeah, yeah. Chuck designed that and built it. The um, the neon was done by his friend Roger. Um, but uh, yeah. Anyway, and that wonderful prow, that big proud prow in front. It's a beautiful piece of work. And it was Darlene Cardinoy, who was mayor at the time, and Jay Inslee, who threw the switch after the movie on that anniversary and lit the marquee for the first time while we all held our glow sticks above our heads. And it was fun. So, and Joel captured that. So yeah, so kudos to my dear love. Um, so don't forget Bigfoot. Um, is at the Linwood Theater this coming Thursday night. Um, this Friday, um, uh, we're doing, Janet Brooks and I are, are hosting a Zoom event called Movie Memories. Um, this Friday at the Senior Center. You can find the link at uh, Graham Dranlin Senior Center. We'll be on Zoom. Bring your movie memories with you whether it's the first time you went to the movies and what that meant to you or what m movie created um, uh, a tsunami in your um, psyche and uh, made you the person you are today. Any movie memories that you have, that's on Friday at uh, 11.30. Um, last weekend in September, I'm doing Manhattan Shorts at the Bainbridge Island Museum of Art. I've been doing uh, man shorts since 2000. I, I had them over at the Linwood all those years and uh, uh, Bainbridge Island Museum of Art uh, provides the space for us to do the Manhattan shorts, 10 short films from around the world. Um, they're only gonna show for a week also around the world. And each venue, each person votes for his favorite film. And these films have the opportunity to be seen in front of the Academy Awards board. And last year, two of the Manhattan shorts uh, from the collection were chosen in the final five um, for an Academy Award. And then last but not least, our uh, smart film series at BEMA begins in October. And uh, because October is also um, Earshot Festival um, at uh, BEMA, the films are gonna be about um, music and jazz. October 11th, um, I have the privilege of being here um, at the Senior Center that Monday, because we're here second Mondays. And I'm gonna have Barbara Lawrence here and she's Suquamish and her father survived the boarding schools. And so she's gonna tell the story of her father on Indigenous Peoples Day at 11.30. And Barbara it, Lawrence is amazing. Yeah, and it, it, would be, it would be great if we could really get people out of the sunshine and on online to support her on that day 